Behold Vader, one of the greatest super heavyweights in wrestling history. A man with a worldwide reputation who built his entire career on the destruction of others in the squared circle. His wars in Japan and in WCW were the stuff of legend, hard hitting bouts that are still revered to this day for their brutality. With a resume such as Vader's, you'd think the World Wrestling Federation would salivate at the opportunity to have him on their roster. But once the contract was signed, the Macedon's run the WWF was a stark contrast to the glory he found elsewhere. In the end, what could have been a prosperous run turned into a waking nightmare. Does that fucking feel fake, huh? I don't care if they lock you or not. You've embarrassed a lot of people. You have any remorse? Do you feel ashamed of yourself? I'm nothing but a big piece of shit. Big fat piece of shit. So what ultimately undid Vader in this run? Was it all the result of backstage politics, or could he have been a victim of his own doing? On this episode, we begin the month of June, or are we still in May? Oh crap, are we in August already? God, we're so screwed. With a closer look at the rise and fall of Vader in the WWF. Before we go to the dark times, it's important to look back at Vader's origins. Debuting in 1985 for the American Wrestling Association, Leon White made his first national appearances as Baby Bull. Despite making his way through the ranks and challenging Stan Hansen for the AWA world title, White wasn't long for the company as it was beginning its decline. Though maybe he could have stuck around a bit longer if they gave him a better name than Baby Bull? Around this time, the baby also worked in Europe for Otto Vaughn's Catch Wrestling Association for a number of years before finally getting his biggest break in Japan. Now known as Big Van Vader, no doubt given that name for his intimidation and his size, the big man made his debut in stunning fashion for New Japan in 1987, fighting and beating a worn down Antonio Inoki. The Japanese audience was so upset by this that an actual riot broke out, leading to New Japan being banned from Sumo Hall for two years. Vader would dominate in Japan and win plenty of championship gold in the process. Oh yes, and almost lose an eye that one time, ugh, before it was time for him to go back to America. After a brief and uneventful run in 1990, Vader came to WCW for the long haul in 92. A lengthy feud with Sting ended with Vader winning his first of three WCW championships at that year's Great American Bash. The reign would be short-lived though, as a knee injury forced him to drop the title three weeks later to Ron Simmons. Tough break, but at least he helped make history on that night. Other highlights of Vader's time in WCW were his brutal battles with Cactus Jack, one of which led to Mr. Bang Bang famously losing his ear in the middle of the match, his great bouts with Ric Flair and Sting, that time that he stormed the beach alongside Colonel Robert Parker and Sid Vicious, and a brief stop in the Dungeon of Doom. The low point of Vader's time in Atlanta had to be during his feud with Hulk Hogan in 1995. The Hulkster had just joined the company and needed to make a big impact fast, so how's about totally no-selling Vader's legendary offense? Sure makes all those other jabronis of the past look soft in comparison. It all came to a head that same year when Vader got into and lost a backstage brawl with then agent Paul Orndorff. That wasn't an angle, mind you, that actually happened in real life. Imagine a big guy like Vader getting taken down by Paul Orndorff, who by this point only had one good arm due to nerve damage. Besides that, he was also wearing flip-flops at the time of the fight. Who kicks somebody's ass wearing flip-flops? Even Matt Riddle kicks his off before a match. That's just a respect thing. Contrary to popular belief, the fight itself didn't get Vader fired from WCW, but it did lead to negotiations over his contract that made him decide to walk away. BVV would leave the company just before the debut of Nitro that September, apparently derailing plans for him to take the title off Hulk Hogan on their second episode. But at least he got to hang around the opening credits of the first week, and he showed up on that episode of Baywatch that aired like six months after he left. Vader's departure was a golden opportunity for the World Wrestling Federation. They were already picking up former WCW talent by this point, but the company had a severe shortage of good heels. By this point, all the company's biggest acts were baby faces, and the heels they had on hand at the time, like King Mabel, Jeff Jarrett, and Dean Douglas, left a lot to be desired. But Vader was a proven commodity, he was legit, and he was a terrific heel to boot. Thus, it was time to board the Vader hype train. The move began with a slight rebranding of his name to The Man They Call Vader, a compromise after Vincent Mann originally wanted to rename him simply The Mastodon. According to rumor, part of the reason for the name change was to avoid a potential lawsuit with Lucasfilm. Oh, you think George Lucas's legal team is tough? Try getting that new name over with Haim Saban. 
After weeks of build, Vader debuted the 1996 Royal Rumble match under the management of Jim Cornette. The big man eliminated four people before being taken out himself by eventual winner Shawn Michaels. He tried taking more guys out post-elimination, only to have them waved off by then-president Gorilla Monsoon. Oh, so those kind of eliminations don't count depending on how they feel at the time? Four guys seems like a paltry amount considering how we've been accustomed to big runs by guys like Kane and Braun Strowman and Brock Lesnar over the recent years, but you know, um, adjust for inflation. Fears of Vader losing his aura right out the gate were alleviated the next night on Raw. After a post-match beatdown on Savio Vega, Monsoon got involved once again, only this time it got physical. Vader responded by beating the stuffing out of Monsoon, one of only two times Gino was ever attacked on television after his entering retirement. Following the assault, interim president Roddy Piper had Vader suspended. The punishment was their way of riding Vader off television so he can get some much-needed shoulder surgery, which he had put off in order to work the Rumble. The deal was finally inked while Vader was on the shelf, one that was actually pretty good for him as he was still allowed to work some Japan dates while under contract. Upon his return, Vader was headed toward a feud with fellow big man Yokozuna, who had just turned babyface against Camp Cornette. But by this point, Yoko's weight had gotten so out of hand, the company opted not to do the obvious one-on-one -on -one encounter at WrestleMania 12. Instead, they pulled a Heroes of Wrestling and turned it into a tag team match, as Vader, Owen Hart, and the British Bulldog took on Yokozuna, Ahmed Johnson, and Jake Roberts. Ooh, that Heroes of Wrestling analogy I made uh, was a lot more on the nose than I thought it was going into it, but uh, at least this time Jake wasn't in his socks pretending his snake was his penis. Not only did Vader win the match for his team at Mania, he and James E. conspired to crush Yoko's leg in an angle designed to write the former champion out to allow him to attend a weight loss program at Duke University. And in case the point about his weight wasn't driven home enough, the sumo wrestler was carried out on a forklift instead of a stretcher. This next joke is an oldie, but still pretty relevant. The World Wrestling Federation. Subtlety, f that. After Vader beat up Razor Ramon on his way out of the company, Yokozuna returned and their feud resumed. Their first and only one-on-one -on -one match on pay-per-view took place at Beware of Dog in May of 1996. Yes, the one that was dark for most of the time. Though Yoko beat Vader in their Sunday encounter, the tables turned when they filmed the do-over two nights later. Needless to say, it was not exactly what fans had hoped for. By this point, both men were past their physical primes and had slowed down after putting on weight. Even Vader would eventually go to the same weight loss program that Yokozuna had been during his time in the company. After being squashed in several matches against the Ultimate Warrior in what thankfully were just house shows and being disqualified in the first round of the King of the Ring tournament against Jacob the Snake Up, Vader was elevated into a main event program with WWF champion Shawn Michaels. Whoa, 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 Brian. Hold on a minute. Oh, hey everybody. It's Anthony Green from Evolve and also from the WCW... Hey, we don't talk about that one, Brian. Anyway... My, uh, my ears perked up a little bit when I heard you were talking about my man Shawn Michaels. Yes, actually, I was just getting to the part where he was having his feud in 1996 with Vader. Brian, 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 please. Don't drag Shawn's name through the mud here. He's my favorite wrestler of all time, and I really can't just, I can't fathom the idea of you tearing him apart. <sighs> Look, Anthony, I'm, I'm not going to make any promises, okay? Just let me walk through what happened. In the main event of In Your House 9 International Incident, Vader and the rest of Camp Cornette faced off against Michaels, Ahmed Johnson, and Psycho Sid in another six-man tag. Sid was a late replacement for the Warrior, who by this point had walked out of the company after a pay dispute. What, you're telling me he wasn't getting paid enough for those 30-second house show squashes? Vader scored a pinfall over the champion in that main event, setting up their big encounter at SummerSlam 1996. Apparently the plan was to have a multi-month program between these two, beginning with Michaels retaining at SummerSlam, Vader winning the championship at Survivor Series, and then Sean winning it back at the Rumble in San Antonio the next year. But plans, as they say, changed. As the build progressed, Michaels began to show his true colors. It's no secret that Sean was a handful behind the scenes during this time. Not only was he in the thick of his problems with the drug and alcohol addiction, he was also given lots of leeway by Vincent Mann, basically allowing him to have his way in almost every instance. It's also no secret that Vader's in-ring style could be most generously described as snug, and the boy toy was not going to have any of that strong style nonsense in his matches. According to Jim Cornette, who was still managing Vader at the time, Sean would verbally abuse Vader during matches on occasion, threatening to have him fired if he didn't let up. Then came the pay-per-view match itself. The match went as follows. Vader wins by countout, Cornette gets the match restarted. Vader wins by DQ, the matches restarted again, finally ending with Sean getting the pinfall. 
Watching it back for this review, I thought it told a great story. Sure, Vader gave a lot to Sean in terms of offense, but it's not the first time Vader sold a lot for a smaller guy. By winning twice before the final verdict, Vader was protected as much as you could while still losing the match. We even saw a ref bump near the end. Even though the match is fine on the whole, what everyone remembers about it is when Michaels went for an elbow drop expecting Vader to move. Vader forgot to move, causing Sean to change course and land on his feet, then stomp Vader in the head, yelling at him to move. Even though Vader made a mistake by forgetting his cue and would later own up to it in interviews, Sean was blatantly unprofessional by throwing a tantrum in front of the audience and on camera. It was just one of the many childish public outbursts during this part of Sean's career that bafflingly went unpunished, but that's a story for another time. No! After SummerSlam, the planned three pay-per-view program was cut down to the one, leaving Vader to finish out the rest of 96 without a direction. To give you an idea of how everything was thrown off by the result of this one match, December's In Your House show is given the name It's Time, a clear reference to Vader's theme and catchphrase. But in the end, the guy wasn't even booked on the show. That'd be like if, if The Rock wasn't in the main event of the Rock Bottom pay-per-view in 98. Man, that is whack. At least Vader got some more of that sweet boy meets world money that year. The company tried to get Vader back on track in a big way at the 1997 Royal Rumble, not only having him beat The Undertaker with the help of his new manager Paul Bear, but by also making it to the final four of the Rumble match itself. Having dropped some weight, he put on what was arguably his finest performance in the company at In Your House Final Four, where he fought Undertaker, Steve Austin, and Bret Hart in an elimination match for the vacated WWF Championship. Though he didn't win the match, he did sport a crimson mask and helped reestablish his monster mystique he'd been losing for the last year. But the momentum didn't last long. WrestleMania 13 saw a rare heel versus heel match for the tag team titles as the new duo of Vader and Mankind fought the British Bulldog and Owen Hart to a double countout and crowd apathy. Vader's problems in the Federation weren't just overbooking, sometimes his body was his own worst enemy. By this point in his run, Vader would often get hurt or sick. For example, at one point in early 97, he tried to work through a case of pneumonia. All these dings and slowdowns would eventually lead to the occasional time off TV. That combined with his reputation in the ring, his weight issues, and his famously poor hygiene made it hard for the company to want to build around him. But despite those setbacks, his program with The Undertaker went a long way in restoring his credibility in the promotion. And now with Taker as world champion, a rematch with higher stakes seemed like a perfect fit. Then they went to Kuwait. Does that fucking feel fake, huh? Does that feel fake? Here's the gist of the story. Vader and Undertaker appear on a morning news show in Kuwait in April of 1997 as part of an overseas tour. The reporter asks the men if wrestling's fake. Taker shrugs it off and calls it entertainment, but Vader pulls a Dave Schultz and assaults the reporter on live television. The police are called, Vader's arrested, and is detained for nearly two weeks. It's one of the most famous examples of when keeping it real goes wrong. Wu-Tang! It's a shame this didn't happen in Saudi Arabia. Think of the crowds that could draw with a match like that at one of their big shows, only to never mention it again. <sighs> After being fined a whopping three figures for his actions, you'd think the WWF would capitalize on this mainstream attention and use the controversy to build Vader up as a killing machine. Instead, well, they used it to bury him. He's guilty of being stupid. What? He was the stupidest man in Kuwait for about two weeks. You've embarrassed a lot of people. You have any remorse? Do you feel ashamed of yourself? If there was one way to rehabilitate Vader's image in the company after the Shawn Michaels fiasco, this was it. It's not like the company had shareholders to appease in 1997. Pro wrestling had always been a little lawless, so who would they be hurting by giving Vader the rub in that manner? But nope, they just called him an idiot and an embarrassment. Dressing Vader down in public instead of just behind the scenes like any other normal human being would do. Instead of facing Taker for the title at In Your House, A Cold Day in Hell, Vader served his penance by putting over rookie Ken Shamrock in a match that was right up both men's alley. Somebody call the governor of Idaho and check their inventory, because there were a lot of potatoes thrown in this one. In Your House wouldn't be the last time we saw these two beat the hell out of each other. In fact, one of those times wouldn't even be for the Federation. Jumping ahead to September that year, the WWF worked out a deal with FMW in Japan to have Vader and Shamrock face off in a cage match under ultimate rules, which basically meant make it look as real as humanly possible. No problem for these two. Also, it's worth pointing out how batshit insane an idea like this would sound today in 2020 with WWE contracted wrestlers. Vader would get his title match with The Undertaker at Canadian Stampede, but would end up on the losing side of things. Fast forward to that August, when the big man would actually turn face to play a role in the US versus Canada rivalry, saving the Patriot and brawling with Bret Hart. This feud with the Hitman peaked at October's Bad Blood event in a tag team flag match as Bret and Bulldog beat Vader and Patriot in an uninspired bout. Not a great endorsement when the newly turned face still loses, and it's a good thing for Vader this show's remembered for something else. Vader would continue to carry the flag for America, 
literally as he led Team USA at the Survivor Series the following month. In that match, Goldust would walk out in his team, leading to a feud between the Bizarre One and the Mastodon. This feud would lead to some timeless moments, like Goldust hitting Vader in the head with a hammer, Goldust pretending to be in a wheelchair, Luna throwing alcohol in Vader's eye, Triple H throwing coffee into Vader's other eye, Goldust attacking Vader with a coconut he'd stuffed into his bra. Vader dressing up like Santa Claus to attack Goldust. And many more. Remember when he used to beat the shit out of people in WCW? Good times. After Goldie eliminated him in less than three minutes in the 98 Royal Rumble match, Vader would finally put the worst feud of his tenure behind him, only to end up in the crosshairs of the recently debuted Kane. The two would fight at No Way Out in February, where Kane not only won the match, but also clubbed Vader in the face with a cartoonishly large wrench. The attack wrote Vader out to heal from eye surgery. Though he'd miss out on a third WrestleMania, Vader would work a Japan date before interfering in the famous Inferno match at Unforgiven, then getting his rematch with Kane at Over the Edge at the end of May. But this was no ordinary match. This was a personal vendetta. They were going to go for the gusto here and have a mask versus mask match. Think about it. Think of the possibility of seeing one of these two men's faces for the very first The fuck? Look, we all know wrestling can be a bit predictable at times, but who honestly thought they were going to unmask their brand new monster heel as if that was even a remote possibility? Not only that, but in kayfabe, putting your mask on the line is the riskiest thing a masked wrestler can do with their career. It would expose their secret identity to the public, but look at Vader! His mask is about as good at hiding his identity as this one is at preventing the spread of germs. Fans had seen him without his mask tons by this point. What exactly was he at risk of losing? Anyway, Vader lost the match to the shock of absolutely no one. Paul Bear created an iconic moment by doing the Vader dance while wearing the mask. Then the Mastodon uttered his now infamous self-deprecating post-match promo. I made the biggest mistake of my life. A train, look at me, I'm so big! Maybe it's, maybe Vader time's over. I'm nothing but a big piece of shit. A big fat piece of shit. By the way, the mask went back on in his very next appearance. Vader didn't really factor into any important plans after that, but that didn't mean the company was done humiliating him. After a brief feud with Mark Henry that saw him lose at Fully Loaded 98, we jump ahead to an episode of Raw from that August where he was set to face the Godfather. Like an X-rated Monty Hall or Wayne Brady, Godfather offered up his ladies to the big man who took the deal, only to get zonked by Bart Gunn for absolutely no reason. After more losses to guys like Ken Shamrock, Mark Marrow, Brad Shaw, and others, Vader and the WWF mercifully agreed to release him from his contract his final on-air match taking place on Sunday Night Heat in October of 98, when he lost to Edge. For all intents and purposes, Vader's WWF journey ends there. His release allowed him to work anywhere in the world but WCW, so he found himself back in Japan on and off for the next several years, even having a brief stint in the early days of TNA. But to the surprise of many, it wouldn't be the last time we saw the Mastodon on WWF TV. Fast forward to 2005, when Jonathan Coachman was in a feud with Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's a fun sentence to say. The two were set to have a match at Taboo Tuesday, but when the Rattlesnake wisely decided to fuck off and not participate, Batista was his replacement. The night before the pay-per-view, Coach announced that, for reasons, a returning Vader and Goldust would be in his corner. That segment's best known for Vader falling on his ass just trying to leave the ring. Ooh, those dastardly backstage politics colluding with gravity like that! Anyway, Batista won the street fight after beating up all three guys, and that was that. Thanks for coming, Vader. At least he get his heat back a mere six years later by destroying a hapless Heath Slater in the midst of his jobbing to legends phase. The big man's final appearance in WWE took place in 2016, when he inducted his longtime rival and friend Stan Hansen into the Hall of Fame. Shortly thereafter, Vader received a grim health diagnosis when doctors informed him he had less than two years to live. He would pass away on June 18, 2018, after a month-long hospitalization with pneumonia at the age of 63. So what caused Vader to have such a disappointing run in the World Wrestling Federation? Was it backstage politics? Was it the injuries? Was it the weight gain? The answer? Yes. The man called Vader had an uphill battle from the beginning due to Vincent Mann's historical bias against guys who had main event success in WCW. Arguably the most pivotal point in his run was at SummerSlam 96. Had the program with Shawn Michaels gone as planned and HBK didn't pull his diva card, Vader's career and the overall picture of the company could have looked a lot different going into WrestleMania 13 and beyond. And let's not forget, the Federation absolutely squandered an opportunity to push Vader as a monster after the Kuwait scandal. It was probably their last chance to save him, and in my opinion, 
opinion, they took the petty route. But Vader was by no means an innocent party during this time. His stiff style was a turnoff to many he was working with, and his weight gain and multiple injuries hampered his entry performance on top of that. Unfortunately, the Federation nabbed Vader in the twilight of his best years, and his performance suffered to the point that the company determined he was more trouble than he was worth. Vader's time in the World Wrestling Federation is one of the biggest what-ifs of the late 90s. Had the cards fallen differently, we'd been having a very different discussion about him. Even if he didn't make too big a splash in the WWF, there's still tons of his work from Japan and in WCW to make up for that lackluster run and to cement his status as one of the all-time greats. It just goes to show you that in WWE, there's no such thing as a sure thing. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and uh, what the heck, here's Mini Vader for you. They are just mentioned, pound for pound. I guess it's Mini Vader time now.